This video was made possible by my patrons, Joshua Bartlett, James Schubach, Douglas Smith, Capitalism is Good, and Pipsqueak. Thank you so much to all of you. This week's Twitter poll ended in a tie, so I'll be breaking it with my own vote. Check my Twitter profile every Sunday to vote for Tuesday's video on My Two Cents. Hello everyone, this is My Two Cents. Recently, I was asked who would be responsible for printing money in an anarcho-capitalist society. It's a good question, but in order to answer it, we first have to distinguish between money and currency. In today's day and age, these two terms are used pretty much interchangeably, although they are actually different. Once you learn the difference, it will become clear that private central banks are not necessary for money to exist. The banks would like you to believe that, but it's not true. Before we dive deeper into the matter, I will tell you up front that the dollars, euros, pounds, or whatever else it is you have in your wallet are examples of currency, not money. Now, I want you to stop and ask yourself why you value the currency in your wallet. Most everyone agrees that currency is valuable, but hardly anyone ever stops to ask why it is valuable. So take a moment. Why do you value your currency over, say, monopoly money? If you think about it, paper currency has no intrinsic value in itself. It's just paper. It only has value in as much as the government has declared that it is legal tender for all public and private debts. This is why it is referred to as fiat currency. Unlike ages past, where currencies were backed by physical gold or silver, fiat currencies are printed by private central banks like the Federal Reserve and then declared to be valuable by the authority of the U.S. government. The only difference between this dollar bill and this dollar bill is that the government has declared one to be valuable. The average person doesn't question this. He just accepts that the one is valuable and so does everyone else. However, the only thing that truly has value is your time and labor. This is what people are truly in need of, and so it is the thing they are willing to trade their currency for in exchange for you providing a service of time and labor. Remember the movie In Time, where in a futuristic world everyone has a clock on their arm that functions as a wallet of time, as it were? You are paid with time and you make purchases with time, but when you run out of time, you die. This movie actually illustrated very well that time is the only true commodity. Time you spend watching TV is time you could have spent working, or playing outside. There's only so much time in a day, and each person has only so many years of life. How you spend your time has implications for you and those you spend your time with. You could, for example, spend all your time playing video games. However, this is to your benefit and not the benefit of anyone else, so it's unlikely that anyone will pay you to do it. Unless you're like PewDiePie and can find a way to market your gameplay such that other people benefit from you playing as well, no one will pay you to play, to play video games as it is not to their benefit. If you want people to give you currency, you'll have to spend your time doing something that benefits them. Now, in ancient times when we were all farmers or tradesmen, we spent our time cultivating crops, raising animals, sewing rugs, or some similar trade. We would then trade the excess of our labor in exchange for the fruits of other people's labor. A corn farmer, for example, might have more corn than he could possibly eat himself, but by trading his excess corn, he could obtain the other necessities of life that other people had worked on. This immediately raises a problem for him, however. The carpenter might not want corn, so if he wants any of the carpenter's goods, He'll have to find people who have the things that the carpenter wants and then hope that those people want corn. As you can see, this makes for a lot of work and excess exchanges, so it becomes necessary to, divide, to devise some sort of medium of exchange, something easily divisible that can be used to represent the time and labor of everyone and therefore be used to more efficiently exchange time and labor or the fruits thereof. It is here where money and currency come in. Currencies, like paper money, are a medium of exchange, a unit of account, so they can have numerical values assigned to them, 
They need to be portable, durable, divisible, and interchangeable. In other words, any two separate dollars ought to carry the same value. Virtually anything can be used as currency. Money, on the other hand, is all those things, but it must also be a store of value. Now, what I mean by a store of value is that it maintains its value over time and it can't be manipulated. To illustrate this, imagine if we tried to use fresh fruit as money. This wouldn't work because over time, fruit rots. It doesn't maintain its value over time and so it can't be stored for exchange later on. On the other hand, imagine a desert society where they tried to use sand as money. Now, sand doesn't spoil over time. But in this case, sand is literally all around them. At any time, any person could gather as much sand as they want, and so no one would be willing to exchange goods for sand. Everyone would already have a practically, practically limitless amount. In order to have value, money must be scarce. This is why every culture has universally embraced gold and silver as money. These metals are durable, portable, they can be divided based on weight, and most importantly, there is a finite amount in the earth, much of which is difficult to maintain. This natural scarcity prevents manipulation. Central banks can dilute the purchasing power of currency by printing more. This is referred to as inflation. However, no one can create more gold and silver without great difficulty. As you can see from this chart, the US dollar has lost more than 95% of its purchasing power since the creation of the Federal Reserve Banking System in 1913. Meanwhile, gold maintains its value. This can be demonstrated by the rising price of gold in accordance with inflation. While this is a rather concise explanation, the loss in purchasing power of the dollar is why the central banking is perhaps the greatest scam ever hoisted on mankind. So long as central banks have the power to print more currency, the currency you have in your savings account will inevitably lose value over time. This is why it is not advisable to simply save your assets in the bank with a savings account. As more currency is printed, the currency you have saved in the bank is slowly losing value. You'd be far better off investing your savings in real money like gold and silver. Granted, there are other investments that are advisable as well, and it's important not to put all your eggs in one basket, as it were. But that is not the main subject of this video. So, to answer the original question, who would print money in an anarcho-capitalist society? The answer is that anyone would be free to print money in an anarcho-capitalist society. It would just be a matter of whether or not the people actually recognize the currency as valuable. Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are in fact a perfect example of this. They were not sanctioned for creation by any federal government. They're only valuable so long as people choose to invest in them. And the choice of users to invest has brought the value of Bitcoin from a few cents to recently more than $10,000. However, I'm much more inclined to think that in an anarcho-capitalist society, they would primarily return to using real money such as gold and silver. Every society in the history of mankind has recognized these metals as money, for the reasons mentioned previously. And the same gold and silver they were trading in ancient Egypt still has value today. There's a reason why governments worldwide try to devalue gold and silver, and why some have tried to outlaw cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. These mediums of exchange cannot be manipulated by the government, and so they are not helpful for consolidating power over the people. So, what does this mean for you now? Well, if you care about your financial future, you should already be diversifying your portfolio, particularly by ensuring that at least some of your assets, I'd say at least 10%, are in gold and silver. Fiat currencies his historically have a 100% failure rate and are simply another mechanism by which government maintains its power over the people. Sooner or later, so many units of currency are printed that they become worthless, such as what happened in post-World War I Germany. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but someday, the US dollar and every other fiat currency will collapse, and with it, all your savings in that currency. Real money, such as gold and silver, will persist, however. Now, as I said, this is a very concise explanation. To learn more, I recommend checking out Mike Maloney's investment channel here on YouTube. It will be linked in the description. That's my two cents. Take it for what it's worth. 
Thanks everyone for watching. If you liked this video, please hit like and subscribe. You can also hit the bell to ensure you're notified every time I upload a new video. This video was made possible by my patrons, Joshua Bartlett, James Schubach, Douglas Smith, Capitalism is Good, and Pip Squeak. Thank you so much to all of you. If anyone else would like to donate and help ensure that I have the time and resources to keep putting out content, for just $1 a month on Patreon, you'll receive a shout-out at the beginning and end of every video, and the link to one of your social media platforms in the description. You can also follow me on Twitter, Minds.com, BitChute, WordPress, Gab, and iTunes. Uploads are every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, so stay tuned for more videos.